So it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Kremos, who is a full professor at the Technical University of Munich uh, since 2009, and has been working on a wide range of topics, uh, including SLAM and visual odometry. And most of you will be familiar with LSD SLAM uh, and direct sparse odometry. Uh, he has won starting grants, consolidated grants, and advanced grants from uh, the European Research Council. He has won um, the Leibniz Prize, which is the biggest award in German academics. Uh, and of course, he organized the EC 2018 in Munich, which was a very nice conference. Uh, and recently co-founded uh, a startup called Artisense, which is doing visual odometry and SLAM solutions for industry. Um, and yeah, Daniel, thank you very much for speaking at our workshop. Okay, thank you, Torsten. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me see um, how to share my screen here. I think this, if you see something, let me know if it works. Uh, just a second. Yes, now let me go to full screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay, very good. So um, thank you again for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be part of this, my first virtual workshop. So I don't know how it works. I hope you can all see me. If you cannot see or hear, uh, or then uh, let me know and uh, I can try to fix it. So this is a talk on the deep direct virtual slam. Uh, the work that I'm presenting has been done uh, in a collaboration between TU Munich and the startup that you mentioned, Artisans. And so uh, it's uh, an effort between uh, these um, two groups. It, uh, most of the work I'm presenting has been done by current and former members of my team, in particular Nan Yang, Lukas from Stumberg, Roy Wang, Jacob Engel, and Jörg Stückler. SLAM is a long-standing problem, often called uh, structure from motion, structure and motion. There's different terms that, uh, depending on who you listen to, have slightly different meaning. But essentially, the aim is to recover camera motion and 3D structure of our world. This is a very long-standing problem. Here, for example, is one of the pioneers, an Austrian mathematician by the name of Erwin Kruppa. And back more than 100 years ago, he proved that if you, you know, this classical result that many of you know, if we observe five corresponding point pairs in two images, then we can recover camera motion and 3D structure of these points. And this is undoubtedly a pioneering result that paved the way for later computer vision and led to what I would often call the classical pipeline of camera-based reconstruction. And uh, if we look at this pipeline, we see that it does follow Krupa's uh, pioneering work uh, in, in fairly closely. We start, you know, as Krupa said, with two images. So we take two images. Then Krupa said we need points, so we extract points. Then Krupa said we need corresponding points, so we try to identify correspondences, typically by descriptor matching using SIFT, SURF, BRIEF, or more recently some deep learning based descriptors. Uh, and then, you know, if the descriptor matching doesn't work sufficiently, we can uh, subsequently deploy techniques like RANSAC that kind of alternate in you do model estimation and correspondence estimation. Once we have a good set of corresponding points, then we can run a, a reconstruction by, for example, bundle adjustment or something like that to determine camera motion and 3D structure. And there's, uh, we all know, quite a number of really groundbreaking works that do that uh, in a quite impressive manner. Nevertheless, uh, I think one should always question uh, prior research, and in particular, even the pioneers, uh, and one of the uh, things I realized is if you buy a camera today and you switch it on, what you see are not points, but you see uh, uh, colors, intensities, brightness values. And it's not really obvious how to identify points. And 
which points to select, which ones to neglect. Uh, and so invariably at the first step of point selection, we throw away a lot of potentially valuable sensor information. Moreover, once we identify correspondences, any mistakes we make in the correspondence identification, they will propagate into the results and we can not easily recover. I mean, ransack is a way to kind of recover from bad correspondences, but it's rather, you know, tricky, rather te tedious and heuristic in many ways. And so from a sensor analysis point of view, the question arises, can we not directly go from the sensory data to an interpretation in terms of a camera motion and a 3D structure? And this uh, approach is something that we typically call direct. So going direct from the raw sensory data, the brightness values of the camera to what we want to call what is the benefit of going directly? The benefit is that, uh, you know, anyone who works on sensor analysis can tell you that the closer you work on the raw sensory data, the more you can achieve in terms of optimality. Because you don't make any heuristic abstraction steps, you don't you do computations on a, on a previous, you know, heuristically extracted subset of points, but you use all available information. Often people say, what's really the difference? In the end, you compute points here, you compute points there. What is the difference? Well, the key difference is you see it in the bottom uh, blocks. In the geometric approaches, the key point-based approaches, we, uh, the traditional pipeline, what we optimize in the end is a geometric reprojection error in bundle adjustment, for example. Whereas in direct methods, everything is driven from a photometric color or brightness consistency measure. Much like in optical flow estimation, brightness consistency is essentially the driving term. And what we'll see in the remainder of the talk, the better we understand the subtle variations of brightness, the more we can achieve in terms of performance, optimality in terms of precision and robustness. And in fact, what we'll see in the remainder of the talk is first of all, I talk about direct methods and how to leverage brightness consistency to drive all estimations. And then I will show how we can leverage the power of deep networks to actually try to understand the color or brightness variations in a more, uh, a more thorough manner. And the better, as I said, we understand the variations of the brightness and color, the more accurate our estimates. And so the aim of the second part is how to deploy deep networks to boost the performance of direct visual SLAM approaches. So part one, direct SLAM, one of the first, and uh, to my knowledge, the first large scale capable direct SLAM approach, a technique uh, is a technique that uh, we call LSD SLAM for large scale direct SLAM. Uh, if you're interested, the code of this technology is online. It's become extremely popular uh, over the last years. Uh, this is a work uh, presented by Jacob Engel at ECCV 2014. And the method is somewhat sophisticated, so let me just uh, give you an overview here. Uh, on the top left, we have an in incoming video streaming at 30 hertz. Um, then there is two components that run alternatingly. One is a tracking component that tracks the camera motion and one is a depth map estimation component. And then these depth maps for all key frames are fused into a coherent 3D point cloud. What makes it large scale on the top right is a similarity a post graph optimization. This is a technique we adopted from LiDAR based SLAM to get a consistent trajectory. Um, yes, my, the, the work, as I said, was done predominantly by Jacob Engel. My, my main contribution was to give the name LSD SLAM, which I believe helped a little bit to make it uh, more popular because it's a name that seemingly sticks. But what makes it direct, maybe let me just go a little bit more into detail into the tracking component. Essentially, as I said, everything is driven by brightness consistency. So let's say we have a keyframe and then we have a current frame and we want to warp the current frame uh, with a rigid body transformation, G psi, so rotation and translation in such a way that the brightnesses for all pixels coincide. 
And so this uh, here you see very nicely how we have a sum over all pixels and then the brightness consistency is essentially the loss function in here. And since we're only estimating six parameters, this is easily done uh, in a course to find linearization framework, much like in optical flow, except we only estimate six degrees of freedom. This is easily done in real time on uh, a single core of a laptop CPU. And so you can use the remaining course to do depth map estimation and also a, you know, global uh, realignment with the pose graph optimization. And then all of it is running here on this laptop, as you see on the CPU with the camera held on the top left. Here you see some results and at least in contrast to what was there before among real time capable SLAM methods, this uh, provides not just reconstructions of a desktop environment, but of significantly larger outdoor environments uh, where you can see that there's fairly little distortion and hence fairly little drift in the estimated camera motion. And uh, the remainder of the talk is actually largely focused on how we can further reduce this drift to get more precision out. The first achievement uh, is actually a follow-up work that Jacob Engel did uh, following LSD slam is sort of the next generation. And to understand what motivated uh, this follow-up, uh, when you look into LSD slam, we do estimate camera motion and 3D structure, but we do so alternatingly. It's not really done jointly. And if you look back at Krupa's work, he showed that it's a chicken and egg problem. It's a couple problem that really needs to be solved simultaneously. That's why it's called simultaneous localization and mapping after all. And so rather than having two alternating threads, we aimed at uh, reconstructing both at the same time in a Gauss-Newton uh, type iterative manner. And so it's something like a photometric bundle adjustment, except in order to make it real time capable, we do it in a time windowed fashion. And this is what's called direct sparse odometry. You see the application here. Top left is the input video. You see there's even people walking through the scene. So it's designed to be very robust to moving objects. It tracks, as you see bottom right, the camera motion at very high precision and recovers a semi-dense reconstruction of the world or a point cloud reconstruction. And here everything is again driven by brightness consistency, but in a window of say seven consecutive keyframes, we jointly optimize their camera position at every time and also the location of these points. Um, you see that obviously, you know, if we track the camera over thousands of frames uh, in an online approach, there is errors that we make that we accumulate. And uh, this is not using a pose graph optimization. This is not using loop closering. We wanted to show explicitly what that drift is. You see the bicycle here on the top left is actually reconstructed twice on the bottom right. There is a drift of roughly two or three meters on a distance of hundreds of meters. So you could say the total drift is something like below 1%. But how can we quantify performance of these methods? This is one of the most important challenges in this domain, but in general, I think in computer vision, how do we measure accuracy of methods? And so uh, this is not easy. Obviously, we can create a simulated environment, simulate the video, and then we know the ground truth. We know the precision and the performance of our method in the simulated environment. Uh, now, I think we all agree that the world we live in is not a simulation, and uh, it may be quite different even if simulations look very photorealistic nowadays, we often find that SLAM methods that perform well in some simulated environment do not necessarily have the same performance when you take them uh, to a real world. And so instead, Jacob found a solution to quantify SLAM performance, which goes as follows. We, uh, he recorded Lots of videos, as you see here, indoor, outdoor, different environments, different types of motion, different lenses, some more fisheye, some more perspective lenses, a very broad variety of scenarios where he wanted his method to work. Now, we, for all of these sequences, we don't know where the camera was halfway through the sequence, but all these uh, sequences have one thing in common. They all loop back 
to where they started from, such that we can evaluate where the camera is at the very end by aligning it to the first image. And so we can have an estimate, we can have a ground truth information about the final position of the camera. And so for each sequence, for each run, we can have a, a total one uh, numbers that uh, describe the total drift in translation, rotation, and scale. And this is plotted here. So on the x-axis, you always see the total error, translation, rotation, scale drift. And on the y-axis, you see the number of sequences where we achieved that total error. And the idea is that if you have enough such sequences, here's 500, that this gives you a statistically reliable estimate of the performance. We performed to what we considered the state of the art in real time visual slam, a very powerful and popular technique called Orb Slam from a team in Zaragoza. And as you can see, dashed is the real time performing method, a solid is the, if you have a bit more compute time to dedicate, uh, then you can get a bit better precision. Uh, you can read these plots in many ways. For example, you can say, what is the maximum error on the best 300 sequences? Warp Slam has an error of around six. We have an error of around one. Or if you, you know, so the error, you can say, reduced by almost a factor of six, essentially. Or in terms of robustness, if you say you want to impose a maximum error of two, how many sequences can you track with that error? Warp Slam can track 100 out of 500 and DSO can track 400 out of 500, which means also a, a drastic boost in robustness, which I believe is due to the fact that we directly, as I argued, uh, leverage the brightness intensity values. And so the better we understand how brightness variations come about, the more precision and robustness we can achieve. And this is somehow, in my view, confirmed by these uh, experiments. But we can go Further, and as we all know, deep neural networks have really swept the field of computer vision in the last decade and have essentially replaced classical methods in pretty much all domains of computer vision, especially high level vision, object recognition, uh, categorization, but even low level vision, optical flow, segmentation is nowadays often approached with deep networks. But one of the holy grails of classical methods, I would say, to date, is the reconstruction of the world from moving cameras. And one can go into an endless discussion why deep networks to date have not shown a spectacular performance yet, have often not outperformed the state of the art. I don't want to go too much into detail here. I want to show you a little bit what you can do with deep networks. For example, you can use deep networks to extract semantic meaning and then reconstruct not just the 3D world uh, but also the semantic meaning of each point in the world. What you see here are reconstructions that we achieved uh, with our startup Artisense where we deployed uh, sensor systems that Artisense has been developing that involve cameras in particular but also inertial and GPS uh, sensors. To, and then we deploy this in a whole fleet of cars to recover very large parts of Berlin here in a publicly funded project in Berlin with many partners, big industrial partners. We showed that you can run this from a fleet of cars and merge all of it in a large map of the world here. I didn't go into detail, but red is uh, the drivable area, blue is cars, vehicles, green is vegetation, turquoise is buildings. So you can distinguish typically about 20 classes depending on what your training data offers. And we traveled a distance of 8,000 kilometers of coverage in total to reconstruct the world. And this is in some sense the main vision of Artisense is to deploy cheap sensory systems to recover semantic 3D maps of the world for driver assistance, for autonomous systems and self-driving cars. Now let's look more into how can we boost the performance of visual slam using this power of deep networks. There has been some efforts lately, starting around 2017, quite impressive results where people show that indeed you can use deep networks to recover camera position, 3D structure. 
in various ways. Nevertheless, if you look at at least the early works from 17 and 18, often in terms of odometry, they do not provide state of the art on the established benchmarks like Kitty, etc. Uh, again, it's hard to summarize why that is, but I believe one issue is that often they try to tackle the problem into a, in an end-to-end -end trainable network. In go the input images, out comes the world and the camera trajectory. And that's maybe a bit overly ambitious. And so what we uh, developed are techniques where we integrate the uh, predictive power of deep networks in the classical SLAM. And there's many ways how you can bring it in. Our first uh, approach was we saw that there's deep networks that can predict the depths of the scene from a single image. Here you have one uh, such example, a network by Kuznetsov and collaborators, CVPR-17. We built up on this and uh, proposed another network that we call StackNet. This is work by um, um, Nan Yang and Roy Wang and Jörg Stückler. And as you can see, the prediction of the depths is significantly more accurate. That, but beyond just predicting the depths, what we propose to do is to integrate this depths prediction into a SLAM approach. We integrate it on two levels. Uh, first, we initialize the depths maps for each keyframe with the prediction of the deep net. And secondly, we add a loss term in the cost function of a classical SLAM approach where in addition to this brightness consistency term that I mentioned, we have a term that says the depth maps should be consistent with the predictions of the deep network. And this is why we call it uh, deep. This is a technique called deep virtual stereo odometry. We can actually train it in a self-supervised manner. Um, and uh, so these predictions uh, allow to predict the disparity for left and right image, in some sense, the depths of the scene. And then we can recover, uh, we can run the classical SLAM approach enhanced by a deep net prediction that assures that the reconstructions are consistent with what the deep network predicted. And as you can see, we can recover very large environments and drive around with just one single camera and have essentially no drift. Uh, this was for a long time, uh, to my knowledge, the most accurate real-time capable monocular system uh, on Kitty, for example. Um, we can compare, but let's go right into numbers. We compare to some, um, at the time, state-of-the-art stereo systems, stereo LSD slam, stereo ORP slam, stereo DSO. Solid is always best performing, cursive is second best. And here comes this deep learning enhanced method. And as you can see, um, it performs quite on par, if not better than these top performing methods although it only uses one single camera. And so I find this is quite an example of how you can leverage deep networks to compensate for missing sensory information. And in particular, what we found is that there's very little scale drift. Typically, you get scale drift if you just have a monocular method, but with a deep network that can predict the world, in fact, even the global scale of the world, uh, you do not see that scale drift. And this is what we'll see further, how we can deploy deep networks to actually uh, compensate for missing information and end up with monocular odometry and SLAM systems that are quite powerful. In fact, we can go deeper, and this is what we do in, in this work that is uh, an oral at this upcoming CVPR conference. It's called D3VO. Uh, again, Nan Yang, the lead author here, uh, um, it's called uh, Deep Depth, Deep Pose, and Deep Uncertainty uh, for Visual Odometry. And so rather than just predicting the depths of the scene, it turns out we can also predict the pose of the camera given two consecutive uh, frames, and we can predict some form of uncertainty, and then all of these predictions are integrated into the SLAM method. Let's go more detail here. So from a single network, as we saw, we can predict the depths if we have two frames uh, in time. We can uh, have a pose net to predict the relative pose between these two frames, so rotation and translation of the camera, and with that we can align the two images and then train the whole network with the self supervised loss, which basically is the brightness consistency again. 
Now, once you do that for real world cameras due to aperture changes and brightness variations, typically, as you see here, even once we align the two images, the brightnesses are not the same. One is significantly darker than the other. We can correct for that with an affine brightness correction, and it turns out we can train a neural network to predict, given the two images, not just the pose transform, but also the affine correction of the brightness with two parameters A and B. And so this is another prediction of a network. And then once you do that, you can correct for these uh, uh, brightness variations due to aperture change, but it's still, you're largely relying on the assumption of a Lambertian world. And now, as we know, if we take a real world image like this one, it's not a Lambertian world. There's metallic structures on the cars, there's windows that are translucent. And in all these areas, brightness is not preserved. And for example, with windows, it's actually very hard to predict what is the brightness in a second image once I see the same point from a different vantage viewpoint. This is very hard to predict. And so what we do here is instead of trying to predict that, we estimate what in the literature, for example, in Alex Kendall's and Maria Claude's works is called aleatoric uncertainty. And so we can, what we do is we basically downweight the residuals in locations of high uncertainty where the network predicts that there is likely not going to be brightness consistency in these locations. And so we can correct for this in, in, the, in this manner. And it turns out we can train this whole network, uh, the PoseNet and the DepthNet, to predict all these quantities. Here you see a prediction of this aleatoric uncertainty and indeed you see in the window and on the cars and even in the trees on the top right where you typically have motion and no brightness consistency the estimated aleatoric uncertainty is high and so we can train this whole network and then integrate all of these predictions into the SLAM method. We integrate it on several levels, both on the front-end tracking and in the back-end optimization. In the front-end tracking, we construct a nonlinear factor graph for brightness consistency and impose it in the back-end tracking. We add respective terms to the loss functions that say the reconstruction should be consistent with the predicted pose, with the predicted depths, etc. I don't want to go too much into detail. This is all covered in the paper, but once we do that, we can evaluate the performance of this method. Let's first look at depth prediction, monocular depth prediction. Here is an evaluation on Kitty and on Euroc. Uh, and you see that it performs quite well compared to the state of the art, uh, or one of the state of the art methods, a technique called MonoDeps2. But beyond that, it also generalizes quite well. So we train it on Kitty and we evaluate it on cityscapes. And what you see here is that uh, the depth predictions are quite accurate also on cityscapes. And if you look on the bottom right, in this area of the windows, for example, the aleatoric uncertainty that we predict here on the right is also quite convincing. Now, as I said, we can go further. We can evaluate odometry. Here is a comparison both to classical methods and to more recent deep learning methods. And you see the method performs quite well, both compared to monocular, but also compared to stereo methods like stereo VSO. It outperforms them. But beyond that, we can go further and show how much we can boost performance, uh, how much we can compensate missing sensory information. Here is a comparison uh, to both monocular, but also visual inertial and stereo inertial methods like Basalt, the state of the art stereo inertial method or visual inertial VSO here. And you see that the proposed D3VO performs on par with these methods, even though in contrast to these stereo inertial methods, it only uses one single camera. You can look into the reconstruction here, for example, mono DSO on the right, and in comparison, D3VO, a much more crisper, sharper reconstruction, indicating that indeed the trajectory is significantly more accurate. Um, this is the last part I wanted to talk about. Beyond correcting brightness variations with the deep network, you can actually try to learn 
brightness variations. For example, if you take, uh, you know, if you want to relocalize in a previously mapped environment, one of the challenges is once you come back to the same environment, left is the old environment, right, we come back to it, you see often you have very drastic changes in lighting. You have, for example, water there in the scene where there was no water on the lift. You have very sharp shadows, very different brightnesses. Or on the bottom, you can have very dramatic changes in weather. The green grass is already all of a sudden snow in winter. And then things, even to humans, look often very different across the seasons. And then it's not so easy to realign yourself to a previously recovered image. If we want to do this relocalization across different lighting and weather uh, lighting and weather conditions, uh, we need a data set, but we also need a method. And what we do here, this is an approach uh, by Lukas von Stumberg, published at ICRA this year. It's called the Gauss-Newton Net for Multi-Weather Localization. And what we do here is we actually train a neural network uh, to do uh, an intensity transformation into a high dimensional feature space. This has been done frequently with deep networks, but what's new here is that we do it in such a way that it is optimally suited for a Gauss-Newton based SLAM algorithm to run. And this is, uh, you can go into the paper for more detail. This is why we call it the Gauss-Newton net. There is actually a Gauss-Newton loss that we introduce here that makes it perfectly suited with a SLAM approach. What you see uh, in this evaluation, we also have a data set that we uh, offer publicly that has images with different weather, you know, and, and lots of moving objects, very realistic, challenging environment. And you see on the bottom left is always the current image, bottom right is the closest image in the data set, in the training set. And here you see the gray point cloud is the previously recovered 3D map. Blue is the new one. Here you see in blue lots of cars that were not there at the first time of mapping. And you see how everything, even the lane markings, nicely integrates into the old map, which indicates that we align uh, the car not just in local coordinates, but also in uh, relation to the global uh, previously recovered world map. And the, our ambition here in developing these technologies is actually to uh, find solutions that allow to relocalize and find yourself in a 3D world without any GPS. So the idea being is that you first map the world in a first run where you have a GPS sensor, then you have world reference coordinates of your points, and then you relocalize yourself in that previous map in the second run where you have only images. And hopefully then at some point we can completely get rid of the GPS dependency of uh, odometry of localization systems for autonomous systems. There's more videos on YouTube. I'm going to uh, conclude now. Here's a data set that we also offer. It's a multi-weather localization benchmark uh, that uses data both from CARLA, a simulated environment, but also from a real-world data set, the Oxford Robot Car data set. And what we uh, collected is uh, nine training sequences from CARLA that uh, have different weather conditions. Here you see it left and right where the very different weather and lighting conditions. And in Oxford, we have also you know, some sunny, some rainy, some snow conditions. Uh, the, the data set is available at, the, at our web. And then we can evaluate and, uh, you know, as always, we're on the top right of these performance plots. What's interesting to note, though, is that we can not only align sunny and overcast, which is what we trained on, but we can train on the pairs of sunny and overcast and have also very good performance and on the transition between sunny and rainy, even though the system has never seen rain or on sunny and snowy, even though the system, the training data didn't actually contain any snow data. So we find that this network does a fairly good job in generalizing this uh, approach, this relocalization solution uh, to multiple weather and lighting conditions. Let me conclude. I talked about visual SLAM and promoted the notion of direct visual SLAM using the sensory data directly to maximize precision and robustness. 
Then I showed how you can leverage the predictive power of deep networks on various levels to boost the performance of these monocular SAM methods. And lastly, I uh, showed uh, that you can deploy it for autonomous systems, create large-scale semantic 3D maps acquired from a whole fleet of cars with the respective sensory systems on board. It allows you to do 3D mapping, to do localization, and also what we call relocalization. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's Christian Nikolajczyk here. Um, I think Thorsten uh, have left. So uh, I will uh, read the questions that the audience asked. I'm sure we would hear an applause right now if, uh, if we have everyone unmuted. But, uh, <laughs> Um, That's uh, okay. Let, let, me, uh, let me ask uh, the questions in no particular order. Actually, some of them may, you may have answered um, in your slide because they were uh, they were put on um, early uh, during the talk. Um, mm -hmm. So from the beginning, um, there is a question about um, what do you think are the limitations of using uh, the photometric error, and where you know at any point the brightness consistency breaks. That's a good point, yes. So brightness consistency breaks and basically one of the things we do by deploying deep networks is to compensate for these issues. And I think I showed that you can compensate uh, in my presentation, at least I highlighted three approaches of uh, different sophistication. The first is that you can try to compensate by correcting for brightness changes, for example, with an affine transformation of all brightnesses to align to the target image. And you can train a deep network to predict that affine correction. The next more sophisticated thing is that if you know these are areas, windows, metallic structures where brightness consistency is clearly violated, you can train a network to predict these and then downweight the residuals in those areas. And the third thing you can do is you can actually train neural networks to learn what are the brightness variations that we observe in our world from rainy to uh, clear sky, etc., and train a neural network to, to learn this um, optimally. And so I was arguing the power of deep direct methods is that we, we, the more we understand about brightness variations, the better precision we can get. And then we move over to saying it's not necessary that we understand the brightness variations as long as the network understands them. And so the network is trained to understand the brightness variations and that boosts the performance of direct slam methods. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, also a couple of questions actually related to um, fusion with other sensors. So which of the mm -hmm. systems, uh, slam systems you, you would is the most uh, sort of suitable and what kind of other sensors like LiDAR, GPM, would that be a, you know, a good to combine with? So uh, this is a question I often get once you're a practitioner that plays an important role. In this presentation, I only talked about visual slams. So how much can you get out of cameras and towards the end, even out of just one single camera? And I think we have an unrivaled performance now in terms of real-time capable monocular uh, odometry. Um, but once you deploy it in a real world environment, in a robot, in a car, etc., and in autonomous systems, then of course you will leverage whatever sensory data you can get hold of, in particular sensory data that is complementary. And uh, what we found works really well is uh, inertial. In particular, when you have fast rotations, camera-based approaches typically have difficulty uh, dealing with that, and inertial sensors are very good at picking those uh, motions up, and so visual inertial is very powerful. Then GPS, in particular, if you have access to something like RTK GPS that gives very high precision, also global reference is important. And then obviously LiDAR is powerful, radar, so you can fuse with all sorts of uh, sensory system. What's important though is once you do that, you have to know what you're doing. So, you know, if you're naive, I would say don't try this at home. And what I'm saying is uh, you really have to know what you're doing and how you fuse sensory information. 
to avoid a system that is dominated by the worst of these sensors, whereas you want to bring yourself into a position where the best sensor dominates the performance. And this is a tricky thing how to get this working. Uh, and and uh, so it's important that you know exactly how to do it. But once you can do it, then it, it does boost the performance. For example, at Artisense, we're doing exactly that. And we have systems that we demo where just visual inertial stereo inertial, you can drive three kilometers through an unknown environment. And once you come back, you have a drift of about one meter or so uh, over three kilometers distance. So we're talking about one third per mil drift of a stereo inertial system. And so this is a boost, a whole order of magnitude or more that you can get by fusing sensory information. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe a final question, actually. There is a, um, one about, um, you know, what would you recommend um, for, I guess, users? Because uh, there is a trend of um, going end-to-end -end with visual odometry and uh, some combined with uh, sort of uh, classical techniques um, for robustness and accuracy. What What is the recommended approach this is hard to say at this point what we are doing is we promote hybrid methods uh, that ex ex exploit the the power of both approaches i think deep learning has a strong power when it comes to for example correspondence estimation or predicting depths you know you can predict depths from a single image this is quite impressive but the classical optimization methods, they are very powerful because they exploit all the information we know about the world. We know exactly how our camera works, how images are projected, how the, point, the world is projected into the camera screen with rigid body motion, with perspective projection. And how should I say, I think it would be stupid to not exploit the knowledge we have. And so the key challenge is, how, and I think this holds for any application of deep networks in our world, you know, we can apply them, deploy them and apply them to many applications, but I would recommend not applying them blindly. And we need to find ways to really, you know, uh, use the knowledge that we have and not throw everything we've done before overboard, but somehow use the knowledge about the, you know, epipolar geometry and all of that jazz, and how to, how to integrate that with, with deep networks. I think this, this is one of the most important challenges for the vision community at large. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so let me quickly applaud, and I think I speak for all the audience uh, for the talk. And, um, <laughs> thank the you very Christian. Thanks Hello. everyone for listening. Thank you again.